discovered, forgotten, in the house on Harbor Street where Matt uh, was born and, and raised. Uh, tonight, Matt will be talking to us about another uh, historical Brantford figure, Alden M. Young. Now, uh, as a companion to tonight's talk, we are partnering with the Shoreline Greenway Trail to do a historical walk of Young's Pond in Pine Orchard. That walk was originally scheduled for this Saturday. However, with the rain forecast, it has been postponed to next Saturday. I think it's the 20th with a rain date of next Sunday. So hopefully you'll be able to join us there. And Matt. All right, thank you very much. Now, you have to hear the talk before you applaud. You have to hear the talk and then you can both thumbs up or thumbs down. Thanks for having me. Um, let me take a few notes as I go here. Let's see. And um, yeah. And uh, I want to actually talk about, oh, how's, how's the mic volume? Good? <laughs> okay. A little looser. Testing. How's it in the back? How is it from here? Okay, I'll take a mask off. I'm pretty far from y'all, but I haven't had my booster yet. So let's see. Okay, close that. Well, they don't like something here, do they? Okay, that's working now. Um, yeah, let me, I want to take a couple notes for the end. Yeah, I want to talk about the diary of Malachi Lindsley at the end. Who here has heard of uh, a fellow named Aaron Lanfear of Brantford? Lanfear family, giant family. He's one of those Lanfears. They spelled it like three or four different ways. But Aaron Lanfear is the only uh, Medal of Honor recipient from the town of Brantford in its history. And I've, I've uh, visited the battlefield where he earned it and everything. He was buried right in Center Cemetery. We're going to have a cemetery tour sometime in the near future. Um, but Aaron Lanfear is featured in that Diary of Malachi Lindsley because they have him at about the age of 12 picking turnips for you know, two cents a day or something like that. So that Diary of Malachi Lindsley is really fun in terms of seeing, you know, how life really was day to day. So how many, let, let's start easy. How many of you have heard of Alden M. Young? Okay, that's good. How many of you have heard of Young's Pond? Same thing. Young's Park, that's the official name for the pond and the park, although the uh, Young family actually called it a lake. If you've been there, it might or might not qualify for a lake, depending on your definition of a lake. But the uh, U.S. Uh, Geological Service has no definition of lake versus pond. So the thesis question for tonight is, Alden M. Young, was he Brantford's Thomas Edison? And hang on just a sec. I'm going to move this power cord so I don't do something terrible to the laptop or something else there. That's good. And the last time I presented this material... It was about an hour and 10 minutes. It might go a little bit longer because that was for a different group. And this is for a historical society audience. And I uh, wanted to add a few more facts, figures, and context for you. We have a hard stop at 745. We should be walking toward the exit so that they can close up on time because it is $1 million if we stay past 8 o'clock or if we're, if we're lingering. Yeah, you, you joke. It's like about the same. Um so let's see. Um, so uh, disclaimer, I was a history major. I'm a big enthusiast about history. I love doing research and reading about history. And I'm sure that if you're here tonight, you probably feel the same way. But I'm not a professional historian. I'm not a biographer. Everything I used was secondary or tertiary sources. I wasn't digging into the Edison family papers. There's some things I don't want to know, nor the uh, Young family papers. But I did a little bit of primary research just a tiny bit here in the library's vertical files. Uh, they've got excellent files on all the different parts of Branford. There's one on Pine Orchard. There's one on the Young family. It's uh, really cool if you develop a sudden interest in one particular topic and you can't find a book or a magazine article about it, ask at the reference desk. Jen is there or Deb or some of the other folks here. Um, yeah, so y'all have probably heard of Herodotus. He's a famous historian uh, from history. He had hardly any primary sources either. He, he heard about stuff and would write about it hundreds of years after it happened. If you read an account of a battle by Herodotus, it's probably been filtered three or four times. That's kind of the information you're going to get from me here tonight. Um, let's go with a quick uh, summary and comparison of our friends, uh, Mr. Thomas Alva Edison and Alden March Young. Born about the same time, born out in kind of the same area. Um, you know, rural areas, um, died a uh, 
big span apart. You see uh, Alden Young died at the age of 58. Um, patents, there are 1,093 credited to uh, Mr. Edison, and apparently there are another 400 or 500 that you know were in development. They never bothered you know getting a patent. It wasn't worth the paperwork in terms of the finance you might get. Um, Alden M. Young, one patent cited in the information I looked in the U.S. Patent Office files, couldn't find a copy of that. Um, but it's out there somewhere. If somebody wants to be a history sleuth, go ahead and uh, look for it. Um, I, I see some people craning their necks to see, should I move over to the right? Is that possible? Will I break anything? Okay. Okay. And if anybody wants to get up and relocate, I won't be upset. And before I get any further, if you have a cell phone, please put it on mute. Um, that would be much appreciated. I think that any presenter who's interrupted by a cell phone ringing ought to be able to go out, pick up the cell phone, take it from the person, and talk to whoever's on the other line and explain what just happened in front of everybody in the audience. Um, so uh, education, Edison was, was homeschooled, really, by his mother. She'd been a school teacher, and she was teaching him at home. And he attended school a little bit, but not much especially because later on he developed a profound deafness. We'll talk about it a little bit. And he took one course at the famous Cooper Union. Apparently it was something in chemistry to further some of the experiments he was doing. It He was doing um, uh, Alden Young, mainly public schools, you know, regular way that a lot of us have done it. And then his father had been a surgeon during the Civil War. So uh, Alden Young started an apprenticeship in medicine and then quickly decided that wasn't for him. I think a lot of us would feel that way. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to be a sawbones. So he went in another direction. We'll talk about that. So uh, first job, uh, Thomas Edison had a great job. And I'll describe that a little bit later. If I don't raise your hand and say, hey, you skipped past this part. But there's some cool stories about Edison as a young entrepreneur. And uh, Alden March Young, his first job after being an apprentice was actually as a telegraph operator. Because that, that was the up and coming you know, technology of the time. That was the internet. That was the cloud of the day. Um, so bibliography, this is, a, this is a brief bibliography. Great book by Edmund Morris. Is anybody familiar with books by uh, Edmund Morris? A Dutch about Ronald Reagan. He wrote a couple volumes about Theodore Roosevelt. Really great writer. And it, this is very interesting. He writes backward. End of Edison's life earlier and earlier and earlier. So it's not the typical biography. It's an interesting way to read it, but it can throw you off a little bit. And a reminder for those just coming in, if you can mute your cell phones, that'd be great. And I'll need a note uh, from your parents about why you're late. Um, and then th there, there are a couple um, resources on Alden Young. Uh, and they're just general descriptions. You find 100, 200, 300, 400 people listed in books like this about Men of Progress, Portraits of Leaders, and uh, things like that. Um, and uh, then a Modern History, of course, that's 1918 of New Haven and uh, Eastern New Haven County. I've got at least one quote from some of those further on. Um, and again, the vertical files here are great. And of course, you've got your friends online to look at, but you have to, of course, be more careful with that. So Thomas Edison, the quintessential American inventor in the age of Yankee ingenuity. Um, in notable inventions, I mentioned 1,093 patents and another 400 or 500 just kind of hanging around his laboratory at the time of his death. Um, and he was an interesting guy as a businessman. I'll compare him to Alden Young as we go further on. So just off the top of your head, Everybody knows like five or six of these. Just raise your hand. What items uh, do you know that Edison invented? I need I need a hand raised. I've got really bad hearing from the Navy. Photographs one, electric light bulbs. He improved the process. People had kind of made some light before, but he got a better vacuum process and he used a better filament. What's that? Generators. Yes, first central power plants uh, were largely engineered by Edison at Pearl Street in uh, Manhattan. Other items? Movie projectors. Yeah, movie projectors. And he had a couple different types. We've got pictures of those to show you. Other things? <laughs> Actually, he, he did better than laptops. And I'll tell you about his telegraph repeaters and recorders. Yes. 
Yeah, telephone, the, the little carbon transmitter thing that we were using well into the 1980s. You, you know, as a kid, when you unscrewed the mouthpiece on a telephone, and there was a part you could take out and hide to get people really angry. That was, an, that was an Edison invention right there. So, of course, I went to an online site just after I warned you um, about it. Oh, let me uh, let me get a laser pointer. Now, you, you don't have one handy, do you? I've got one right there somewhere. Can't hear mine. If I don't find mine, I'll grab it. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, okay. can people see that back there? Yes. Okay. So, can anybody name this language? German. German. Um, can you guess, besides Germany, what country it might have been in? It wasn't in Germany. It was in Austria. It was in Vienna. And uh, it, there's a whole backstory about how Joseph Stalin and the West fought over historical plaques and who could make themselves seem the best. This is an outcome of it. But he actually did live in Europe for quite a while. He toured there for pleasure and also had commercial interests there. Sorry if you couldn't hear me for a minute when I was away from the mic. Okay, so let me go down to our History Channel friends. So I love this one because of what it says here. Do not attempt to like with men. <laughs> Simply turn key on wall. But there, there were some people who were so afraid of electricity, they would not turn the key. They, they would have, and can you hear me in the back when I step away from the mic? Okay, you're not going to hear me on the recording though, are you? Very well. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll try to do it like this. Um, I think there was one president who refused to touch electric switches in the White House and he would have a servant come in or sleep all night with the lights on. Can't, can't remember who that was, maybe Hayes. Um, and then in, in lower, smaller script, kind of pixelated, the use of electricity for lighting is in no way harmful to health, nor does it affect the soundness of sleep. Huh, pretty cool. And, and I grabbed some pictures um, from patent office files of electric light bulbs. And here you can see T.A. Edison. Um, right there. So that's his actual signature for that patent application. Does anybody know the material he decided to use for the filament for his first successful light bulbs? Before before that, yeah, carbon. Does anybody know what the carbon was made from? This is really diving deep into an inventor history. Bamboo. He found that bamboo had, he could char bamboo. Really great uh, illumination resulted from that. And of course, as somebody said, they went to tungsten and other materials later. We talked about the phonograph. There you go. I, I, I love the ads. I mean, they, they had their own ad men and they were, I'm sure, all men back then. They had their own ad men, little child dancing, couple dancing, the old folks sitting there and watching. And, you know, an interesting thing about um, Edison's deafness, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but he was kind of hard of hearing as a kid for some reason. And then at the age of 12, he had scarlet fever. And that really can affect people's hearings. He was profoundly deaf in one ear and just plain really deaf in the other. And the rumor is that he would actually put his teeth into a piano or into a phonograph so that the sound could go into his skull. So how amazing is it that somebody who invented the phonograph was pretty darn deaf? Somebody who worked on the telephone, pretty darn deaf. Uh, I've got a little bit of hearing loss in, in one ear from the Navy. And, you know, I haven't invented anything fancy. <laughs> so, oh, and this is, this is what some of the early recordings look like right here. They were actually on tinfoil before he figured out that wax or the special needle was a better way to, to do it. And then we talked about movies. That's another one of the um, History Channel's items. And he really had two talking pictures. He had something called the kinetophone, where somebody, they had giant arcades full of these things where people would go up, they'd look down into a box, see moving images down there while they were listening to the recording. Uh, he, he figured out how to do the... Uh, synchronicity in order to make that work. And then of course, he was able to figure out how to project them. Was he the first person to come up with this idea? Mm, probably not, no. Lumiere's out of France and some other folks have done a lot of work in the same way. A lot of people accuse Edison of being a thief for a lot of inventions and like grabbing patents in the US that people had already applied for over in Europe. I've got no input. I didn't do the primary research on that. Um, well, interesting couple of things here. You see, Edison, kinetoscopic record of a sneeze. So this is very famous. He's taking some snuff up there. And then you can see all the way down to the bottom where he's uh, sneezing. He built film laboratories in, uh, I think it was in New York City. It was called the Black Maria. 
because it was all blacked out around it to get um, good recording. And then here's Edison with the thir first 35 millimeter film um, ever that was being made for movies. They had to figure out the process of putting all together and making it run on sprockets. Can anybody guess who this guy is handing him the film? Somebody famous in film history, photographic film. It's actually, it's it's a Eastman. Uh, I think his first name was George of Eastman Kodak. That's the guy. Uh, boy, I'm sure he got tired of working with Edison. Edison couldn't hear. He was so demanding about the product and everything. But that's him right there. Uh, we talked about the uh, the telephone. He figured out that he could put little pieces of carbon in there, and he actually founded a company called National Carbon, um, and that's what helped um, transmit the sound much better than the earlier methods. I think I have a, a further note on that. Let's see. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, so I said that was used into the 1980s, um, and that's, that's from 1878. So, of course, Alexander Graham Bell had already invented the telephone and had a lot of systems working and things like that. But Edison realized that with carbon and a, fill, and a you know, diaphragm, he could get much better transmission and reception. And there's uh, Edison and his wife, Mina, at the, let me make sure I read this correctly. The at t Palace of Liberal Arts at the Panama Pacific Exposition Grounds in San Francisco. So he not only got to Europe, he got all over the U.S. Listening to one of his own phonograph recordings being played in West Orange, New Jersey. Listening to it over the telephone at that place. I, I'm sure people gathered around to the great inventor. Alkaline batteries. This was new to me when I started the research. He invented alkaline batteries. Um, Mining lamps, because of course you don't really want flames down there. Easier to carry on a train and submarines. Um, yeah, he, he developed a lot of the early uh, Navy submarine batteries because of course they need batteries. They've got to submerge at some point and run on batteries. And that was actually a big success for him. In a career that had a lot of failures, Edison's and a lot of wasted money, um, he uh, invented that. When we were talking about laptops and cell phones and stuff like that, this is a telegraphic repeater. It used to be that people, when they were, you've seen the old movies where somebody's listening, dot, dot, dash, dash, dot, and everything like that, and saying, oh, it means this. Well, that's a really slow way to do it. People could usually do something like 25 words per minute. <laughs> and there was a British system that recorded uh, using some sort of special paper, um, about 150 words per minute. Edison system was a thousand words per minute, which meant you could really, really transmit a lot of data, a lot of things. Now, Edison had started working on stock tickers early on, and he realized that that same technology could work on this as well. He had patents for, um, you know, te telegraph stock tickers. That's part of the 1093 patents. And here's another uh, face from the past. Anybody recognize that inventor, an industrialist? No, but I was just right near Tesla's home in um, Croatia, but it's not him. He, he was younger than uh, Edison anyway. Uh, automaker. Yes, Henry Ford. Edison and Ford and um, Firestone. R.V. Firestone, I think it was. They became great buddies later on in life, and they went on big vacations together and built houses near each other at times and things like that. And in fact, Edison's uh, Menlo Park Laboratory was actually picked up and moved to Michigan as part of a big display that's really, I think, a lot about the Ford Motor Company or kind of because Henry Ford was such an admirer of Edison. And somebody mentioned generators. So central power plant. This is not one of the items picked by History Magazine, but these are all drawings that have, again, I, I couldn't wear my glasses, so I'm nearsighted. I, I, oh, there it is. T-H-O-S dot A dot Edison. Right down there. So these are all his patents for building the uh, the central power plant that we all come to rely on. Now, somebody mentioned Tesla earlier. Anybody know the big difference between Edison's power plants and Tesla's power plants? AC and DC. AC and DC, yeah. And Edison was all for DC. You've heard about electrocuting elephants at county exhibitions and things like that. Edison would do that with AC power to prove how dangerous it was. But Tesla came to the US and pitched his idea for alternating current 
and ended up building most of the Niagara Falls uh, power system up there because the, the leaders up there listed, yeah, AC makes more sense for transmitting long distance. Why History Channel didn't pick this, I don't know. Oh, you, you know, one other thing I wanted to say about light bulbs before I forget, I worked here years ago as a page. Take a look up at those wall fittings. Um, and Jenna knows this, and I know this, but why do they look weird like that with light bulbs and then some other fitting light bulb, some other fitting in the middle? Gas lights, yeah. When this was built in the late 1890s, nobody knew of gas, you know, coal gas or whatever, or electricity was going to win. So this entire place was outfitted with uh, fixtures that could go with either, you know, depending on who the winner was out of the technology. Mm -hmm. That's right. I talked a little bit about his... Um, Early education, um, he was very driven and independent. As I said, his first job was uh, selling food and newspapers on a train that ran from, he, I mentioned he was born in Ohio. His parents moved to Port Huron. His family history is interesting. Some of his ancestors um, were sympathizers with the British during the Revolutionary War. They moved to Nova Scotia. One of them engaged in a rebellion against the Canadian government and had to hightail it out of Nova Scotia to Ontario. And then later, some of the family moved back down to the U.S. And then they ended up in Port Huron, Michigan. Um, so for, for this, he, he got a gig, you know, selling papers. And then he ended up printing his own papers. He hired up to four people to actually walk up and down the train, eventually to walk up and down the trains um, to sell the goods. And then he'd get the profits from it. Uh, what, what else was interesting? Oh, I know. Battle of Shiloh, which I think was 1862. He increased, there was such a demand to find out about the Battle of Shiloh, and there was not very good communications. And so the usual price of a paper was five cents. And as the train went along the line further and further from the communication, the central communication, he kept increasing the price. So it went from five cents to 10 cents to 25 cents. So he could get bigger profit on the input. That, that's an entrepreneur for you, right? So that's market scarcity and uh, disequilibrium of information, they call it. Apparently, he was making, I think, $50 a week in 1862. Imagine how much money that was as a young man. Maybe it's a month, but it was a lot of money. And he paid his parents rent. And he also spent most of that money on materials for scientific experiments that he wanted to run. I, I see somebody looking skeptical. I think it's $50 a week. Maybe it's a month but still a lot of money for a young kid back then. Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, he, that profitable business experience in the fourth bullet, that's a battle of Shiloh bit, but there's another story that circulates that while he was at the train station um, selling newspapers and doing, running his other business, a young boy went onto the state, went onto the uh, train tracks. Edison saved his life and it turned out it was the son of the station master and the station master said, you know, you've got promise. I like you. Thanks for saving my little boy's life. I think the boy was three years old. Um, I'll teach you how to operate a telegraph if you want. And Edison said, oh, yeah, two thumbs up to that. That's the up and coming technology. I'll take that. So let me see. Yep, there you go. OK, Alden March Young. I'll, I'll let you uh, I'll, I'll just read this for you. Um, Quote, from A Modern History of New Haven and Eastern New Haven County. To sum up the life of such a man, that is young, in a few words is impossible. His vision of the future and his driving energy brought to this community the results of inventions and improvements many years before they might have been normally expected. He was a man whose passing left a void in both family and community. Hmm. Okay. So here's a quick recap of what I talked about earlier. You know, Edison born 1847, young 1853. Edison died 1931, young 1911. Age of death, 84 versus 58. The number of patents, over a thousand for Edison and one cited for young. Education, Edison homeschooled and uh, Alden March Young doing the you know typical thing public education, then an apprenticeship of some type. Then uh, his early life. I mentioned already that his father had been a Civil War um, surgeon. And then, quote, according to the modern history, abandoned medicine as a career and took up electricity. 
which was to be the medium of his greatest help to, the, to his community. Again, that was the internet. That was a cloud computing at the time. So Young became a telegraph operator for Western Union in Syracuse. So he's still up in New York and in Buffalo, then New York City. He's moving up and up in terms of the seriousness of the assignments he had. And then he became a manager, still fairly young. Um, then things really changed. Edison, for a while, had been an itinerant telegraph operator. He lived in lots of different places. One of the reasons was that Thomas Edison, um, at one point, apparently almost caused a train collision because when he was operating telegraph, he was busy with a science experiment or something and didn't send out signals in time and two trains almost collided. Another story is that he was again doing science experiments with some chemicals and he spilled something and you know he cleaned it up. Well, it was acid and it dripped onto the floor and there were cracks in the floor and it fell through the floor and onto his boss's desk in the room below. He was fired the next day. So um, yeah, telegraphy as an operator didn't work out that well for Edison. He spent a lot of time traveling around and you know barely scratching, uh, barely making a living. And at one point he was living rent free in a basement in New York City um, where somebody who was uh, an inventor who was an engineer, was uh, wanted Edison's help figuring out some processes. So he let Edison live there. Edison had virtually no money at that point. But back to our friend, Mr. Young. So something really changed very quickly. He'd been a telegraph operator, telegraph office uh, manager. Um, Young moved out of New York, moved to Waterbury, became superintendent and manager of the, quote, Waterbury Automatic Signal Telegraph Company, oversaw the installation of the first telephone in Waterbury. And everybody knows where the first commercial telephone exchange in the, in the world was, right? New Haven. We actually have a switchboard at Harrison House, um, which is from the New Haven central office that lists only like 10 or 12 numbers in Brantford. That was the, the Brantford switchboard. Um, and Alden Young just kept adding items to his resume and doing things concurrently and simultaneously. He helped form the New England Engineering Company and was its president until his death. Um, he returned to an office at even higher as secretary, that is not, not the secretary who writes notes and types stuff, but the secretary who's an officer of the corporation. And then um, he chartered and operated a company which furnished electric light and power in Waterbury. Waterbury, big thriving industrial town. I've got a photograph here of the Waterbury Clock Company's buildings. If anybody's been to Waterbury recently, um, they've done a great job saving and restoring a lot of the brick buildings there, the old factory buildings. You drive through that big highway thing that they call the Mixmaster, and you look out in every direction, and they're giant brick buildings. And they're, they're more out of sight that I've been to where uh, some a subcontractor for the Historical Society works. So Alton Young just keeps moving up and up from being a hands-on or an office manager to going into corporate management. And this one's titled Alden Young Branches Out Even More. That's a photograph of a man. It's kind of blurry walking uh, with a trolley car behind him. But what's, for, for anybody uh, who can see the detail in that, what's interesting about that trolley car? Horse. Yeah, it's horse. These were all horse. What, what, uh, what Alden Young had done in Waterbury and what he later did down in the New Haven and West Haven areas was he converted these from horse trolleys into electric trolleys. Does anybody know? I have no idea. The Shoreline Trolley Museum, does that have any horse-drawn trolleys in its collection? So. Yeah, I mean, they're called the Brantford Electric Railway Association. So you'd think they'd be all electric. But yeah, that, that, that'd be interesting to see if they have one tucked away. Um, yeah, so going on just continually, by 1893, over 200 miles of wire had been strung in Waterbury. He made his next big move. Um, he'd already brought electric traction power. And traction motors are what those DC motors are called. My company works on them. I work for a company with electric in its name. We work on motors and generators. Um, he'd already done that in Derby. Um, now the name of the Waterbury Horse Railroad Company changed to the Waterbury Traction Company. And he was chiefly responsible, not just you know for taking minutes as secretary, but really for digging in and bringing the whole thing to electrification. So he was getting electrification to houses. He was getting it to the trolleys. And then he figured out how to do that in New Haven and West Haven as well. Matt, yes. Sure. Is that all over lines? Yes, everything, just like having the Shoreline Trolley Museum. That, that system's pretty efficient, except in you know terrible weather when the wind knocks it down. 
underground lines are really hard to run. And if you have like a third rail that's electrified, like the New York City subways, you'd be out in the open as opposed to, you know, in a tunnel where you can try to keep people away from the tracks. Um, let's see. So, so by now, Young had been successful in all sorts of different areas and all the new technologies, telegraph, telephone, electric power, uh, generation distribution, electric lighting, electric trolleys. Oh, and a Brantford water supply. So we'll get into this part a little bit more later, but he and his wife were vacationing down in Stony Creek. They lived up in Waterbury. And uh, apparently they looked over from Stony Creek, Phelps Island or somewhere. Um, and they saw this nice area down there. It was just being developed. Uh, people like Baker and, um, let's say I think Warner and Blackstone were in on the early stages. They, they were kind of starting when, when Young decided that he wanted to move to Pine Orchard. And that, that's a whole separate topic that's, that's not the topic tonight. Um, so he'd done all sorts of different stuff and that's how this really paid off for him. I think this is where he really made his big bucks. He, Connecticut, he uh, created the Connecticut uh, Railway and Lighting Company which absorbed a lot of the smaller railway and lighting properties in Connecticut, made them into one unit that was capable of proper and economical operation. That's what the modern history, a modern history book talks about. And he also quote, he organized, reorganized and consolidated companies in many cities and towns in New York and New Jersey, and later in Ohio, always building up and leaving the industry in a more efficient condition than he found it. So I've got a slide here. Uh, when I reviewed the names of all the types of uh, the locations of all the different um, companies on this slide, you can see I've got New York at the center where he had his business offices and he had operations in New Jersey, New Haven, Waterbury, Springfield, out to Corning in Elmira, New York. So the guy was a powerhouse in the Northeast consolidating all of these things. Let's see. And his other commercial interests. So it doesn't stop here. I mean, he's already on the board or organizing or has partial ownership or stock in all these companies. Um, the American Gas and Electric Company, the Electric Bond and Share Company, the American Power and Light Company, president of the Central Railway and Electric Company of New Britain. And then in about eight other electric and gas companies in Connecticut and several additional ones, New York, New Jersey. And pay attention to this. I'll talk about this a little bit more in contrast with Edison. Young was also director of the National Carbon Company, a cement company, two real estate companies, and other ventures. And here's the part where I talk about his battery. He patented an electric battery in 1885. But something I forgot to mention about Edison was that he really made and blew fortunes over time. He would come up with a great technology. He'd license it out, get some small royalty for it, but then he'd come up hard for money to invest in a new project. So Edison would then um, say, okay, I'll throw all my money into this. I'm going to come up with a, with a great idea. There was one idea he had because iron ore was very expensive on the East Coast. A lot of it came from the upper Midwest, um, some of the mines out there. He said, you know, there's a pretty good ore content in beach sand, surprisingly enough. And there's also a good ore content and a mineral called magnetite. And he found some of each in New Jersey and came up with this new process where he used magnetism to extract the, the more purified iron out of the stuff he crushed up. So he, in Ogdensburg, New Jersey, he built a giant mining operation and they would pull all the ore out and they would crush it. And he built bigger and bigger crushers and figured out how to get magnets to pull this stuff out. And then all of a sudden there was a big iron strike out in, I think it was Minnesota. I think they still get some iron from out of there. And so East Coast iron that he was producing just was uneconomical anymore. Um, so he went bankrupt on that. And what he said about that was something along the lines of, well, we've spent all the money and then some, but we had a lot of fun doing it. So the, the, the guy was always having to go back and look for more money to do more research. But the guy was so inventive and knew so much about chemistry and industrial processes and everything that when you read Cement Company and National Carbon Company, Edison figured out uh, somehow that the, the waste sand from his mining operation was really good for cement. If you've heard of Portland cement, the sand was superior for that. It created a stronger, more durable type of cement 
And so he founded the Edison, because he'd had Edison General Electric, he'd had Edison Electric Lighting, he'd had all these other Edison companies. Now it was the Edison Portland Cement Company. And uh, he made a great product. It was what was originally used for Yankee Stadium. And it must have been 60 or 70 years after Yankee Stadium was built. I don't remember the year. I think it was in the teens. Any big Yankees fans know when Yankee Stadium was originally built? I, I didn't look that up. In the teens, the, the early, early. Yeah, so yeah, 1910s, 19, yeah, 1910s, I think. Um, when they renovated that in, I think it was 1973, 1974, they ripped out a bunch of stuff. But when they tested the cement, they realized it was so strong and so durable, they weren't going to touch Edison cement. It was a superior product. No reason to take that out. You know, that makes me wonder what Yale Bowl is built of. See, I give a talk and I end up with more questions than I can give out answers. Um, so unfortunately, the, the Portland uh, Cement Company went bankrupt. Great Depression, not as many people using cement for anything. And uh, that went bankrupt. Another one of Edison's um, you know, great ideas. That, of course, you can't blame somebody if the Great Depression is driving you out of business and not some other problem. So back to uh, our friend Young, uh, Pine Orchard. So he first purchased property in 1893. And a quote from the modern history is, quote, talk about Branford in general. Hither comes a multitude of pleasure argonauts. You don't see that in print very often. Argonauts that sometimes outnumbers Branford's 7,000 people. You know, I was just reading something today or yesterday about Martha's Vineyard. I think they go from 20,000 people to 90,000 people in the summer. I know Old Saybrook doubles or triples in size, but Brantford was right there with all the steam traffic coming from New York and all this other stuff going on. So the thesis question remains, and then we can uh, entertain questions. I can talk a little bit more about Pine Orchard and some upcoming activities for the Historical Society. Was Alden M. Young Branford's Thomas Edison. We could have a debate and somebody could take pro and somebody could take con, but um, in terms, well, does anybody want to volunteer a way in which they were very similar? I would say inventing, of course, we only know about one patent for Young, but he was not only somebody who knew about the technology, but somebody who could engineer new things and bring things to fruition uh, the same way that Edison could. Entrepreneurial, yeah, they, they made money sometimes, but one was much better at, at holding on to it than the other one was. But yeah, they, they both were entrepreneurial. They saw opportunities and they went for it. Yes. Oh, that was a, that was a battery for uh, Alden Young. Yeah, again, I looked for a record of that in the patent office files. I found a bunch of images on Wikimedia, uh, you know, Wikimedia Commons where you don't have to worry about copyright, but I found nothing for Alden M. Young. Um, if anybody wants to sleuth that out, go right ahead. Um, and oh, all the images in this, um, I think they're all open source. I try to use Wikimedia Commons or other sources all the way along. If I violated somebody's copyright, sorry, I, not the first person to do it, probably won't be the last. Uh, other ways in which uh, Young and Edison were similar. Any thoughts? They learned from when their mistakes were built on that. Yeah, yeah learned from mistakes and built on that and so it succeeded and kept building on that. Now, differences. I said Edison blew fortunes and apparently Alden M. Young never did. Edison had a lot more inventions going on. Oh, another difference I forgot to mention. Um, one of the things that Edison is credited with is pioneering the first type of massive laboratory. We had engineers and craftsmen and scientists all together. So that was first in Menlo Park. And then when he expanded into West Orange, New Jersey, he just had a bunch of people together inventing stuff. And I have a quote from, uh, let's see, this is the uh, historian at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And he wrote a book called The Age of Edison, Electric Light and the Invention of Modern America. Um, his quote is, when Edison raised enormous capital, built a laboratory at Menlo Park, New Jersey, and hired a staff of several dozen, each with distinct talents, that's the important part, he pioneered what became the modern corporate research and development process. So that's this author, Ernest Freeberg. 
He continued, he considered it an invention factory, one that would produce surprising new products at a regular rate. With over 1,093 patents and, you know, four or 500 others like lying around in the corners, you know, not ready to go. I think that's pretty good. Um, can anybody name any other uh, innovation centers that have arisen in the U.S.? There's a famous one also in New Jersey. Bell Labs, that's exactly. That was famous where they set it up so that the craftsmen, you know, the actual technicians and the scientists and the engineers had to bump into each other. They weren't at like separate ends of the building, but they made it so that they had lunch together. They talked about ideas. It's like a research university, but for uh, private enterprise. Um, any other uh, differences between my uh, friend Edison and our friend uh, Young? I, I think they're both entrepreneurs. They, they could see things. But Bob's comment was, is it fair to say that they uh, that Young was a better entrepreneur and better businessman? I, I'd say they're about equal or Edison might have the edge for the entrepreneurial stuff because he had such broad knowledge, the chemistry, the engineering. He had so many brilliant people that he hired in from all over the U.S. Uh, and North America and Europe. Um, and then uh, Young, I think, knew how to make money, keep making money and hold on to it to the point where he was able to build his massive estate down in uh, Pine Orchard. Edison seems to have traveled a lot more than uh, Young did. Uh, the, the comment is Edison seems to have traveled a lot more widely. Yeah, I think times when he was flush, he would take his family to Europe. They had a giant touring car. It did all sorts of exciting stuff over there. I'm not aware that Alden Young ever did that. His daughters may have. He had Edison had six children. Um, uh, Young had four children, all daughters, um, all married. Two at least lived for quite a while on the uh, Young estate by the, you know, wh where the Anchorage was. It was torn down years ago. Um, one of them lived in the Warner house until her death. Um, she was Warner. I um, can't remember her first name. No, um, but she was something young, Warner. There was another hand raised about Edison and Young comparisons. Go ahead. See, Edison has a lot more advertising appeal to the public, so his inventions have gone on public opinion and affected most of the government. That, that's a great point. Yeah, Edison was a often a direct to consumer or sometimes a government because his electric battery work included stuff for, for submarines and stuff. But yeah, Edison was his companies, they were marketing to consumers. Um, and he, he was a showman. He did a lot of stuff out in public. And, uh, you know, he was, you know, the wizard of, what's that? Much better PR. Um, yeah, but, you know, it's, it's funny. I mentioned what my company does. We repair motors and generators a lot of times for the electric power industry. The amount of advertising we do is virtually nil because, you know, we're not on Main Street advertising to the consumer. We're not selling a phonograph or a home movie projector or any of the other things. Um, we're, we're selling to people who, you know, have their power plants out of the countryside or something. So if, if you saw an ad from us in the New Haven Register, it'd be wasted money because you don't have a 10 foot diameter motor. So that's pretty much where Alden Young was. I mean, he, he was pitching his, his products, his companies, his organizations. Um, yeah, let me see. Like he had to get somebody's permission to build electric railways because there was some fear of electricity. I mean, just like we saw in that light switch, you know, ad, you know, don't be afraid. It's it's not going to hurt your health or your sleep. You know, at some point, Alden Young had to say, we're going to get rid of these horses and instead we're going to use electricity. And you know that there was somebody on that city council that said, wait a minute, electricity kills people. So he, he had to move that forward. And the rest of it was behind the scenes, just amalgamating companies, making them more efficient. You know, your staff can travel further and support each other uh, as in a big utility. Any other thoughts about Edison and Young? Uh, he's saying he thinks uh, Edison was a little more hands-on. Oh, I de definitely. I think you're 100% correct. Edison, you know, in Menlo Park and in West Orange, he would actually sleep um, in in the uh, in the laboratory. He'd curl up at two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning, put a, a coat under his head, and just sleep. And he had a he had a wider range. We, we talked about. Um, Alden Young's diversification. 
Thomas Edison was an expert in so many things. One of the biggest things he did was working with Firestone and Ford to figure out a better type of uh, latex rubber. So he went through over a thousand plant specimens at a house that he built down in Florida and finally ended up with, it's going to escape me now. Uh, that has latex in it, but it was something else that he found. But yeah, he, he came up with a great latex product from a plant that actually people didn't think would have it. Yeah, I've got my hands stuck with milkweed latex and it, it is sticky stuff. But by synthesizing it and, and purifying it, they came up with a much better uh, rubber than a synthetic one or, or not from a rubber tree plant, which is they want to get away from using rubber tree plants because of scarcity of supply in the US. But was there another comment over here? I don't know. I, I've been, I've been, vulcanization to make rubber. that was good year for the vulcanization. He accidentally spilled some sulfur, mixed sulfur into some raw rubber and it like fell on the stove and probably made the house smell terrible. Yeah, that, that was good year who basically went poor and ruined his health, but discovered something that we really needed. Um, but mainly I've been all Edison and all young for the past couple of uh, weeks doing the research. Other thoughts, freewheeling thoughts. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. And he also in, in uh, New Jersey, they had a grand illumination um, where he had. Oh, and actually, Alden Young did that, too, at his place down in Pine Orchard. But yeah, Young lit up his whole property with electric lights. So there were the only electric lights like for miles and people would drive by on the railroad and just stare in wonder at all these electric lights because there were earlier types of electric lights. There was a house that was lit with electricity um, that I think Edison visited. I think it's actually in Connecticut, West Hartford or somewhere. So somebody with a better memory than I have is going to have to remember. But I, th I think Edison visited and said, yeah, this is pretty good, but I can do better. Those might have used some of the earlier forms of lighting, like arc lamps or something like that, which were super bright and super dangerous. That's what they'd use for giant spotlights. But you didn't want to light a house with those. You know, besides the fear of fire, they were much more expensive and they didn't last as long, but they were being used in theaters already. Any other questions, comments, thoughts on Edison or Young? Okay, let me uh, open up uh, another, oh, Pine Orchard. We're gonna have, the Historical Society will have other uh, events and features about Pine Orchard. Um, so this is, what's pictured here is a great big anchorage with a big American flag on top. And I've got some stats on it. Um, this this house, which is one of, a, I think it was 33 buildings on the Young Estate, and I'll describe those in a minute. It had 21 rooms, 10 baths, 10 fireplaces. And of course, he brought electricity trolleys and central water to Branford because he wanted all those things in Pine Orchard when he settled there. Um, and it had all those additional buildings. He had about six houses, a cow barn, a horse barn, a hay barn, a dairy, a duck coop, a piggery. So he had a building just for pigs, um, multiple greenhouses. He had an ice house. And those are topics for another time. Let me bring up a couple other images. Um, any final thoughts, questions, or comments about our friends, uh, Mr. Edison and Mr. Young? Oh, I don't know where they were. <laughs> It, it might might just be it might just be an issue of perspective, but I toured the Warner. I I toured the uh, Warner House before it was demolished, and that had been like a cute kind of cottage thing with beautiful field stones right at uh, 265 Pine Orchard Road. And then at some point, people had built servants' quarters and really pushed it out and kind of made it a white elephant, unfortunately. But it, some parts of that were absolutely beautiful, and he, they built in all different styles. You know, on the Young Estate, they had some that were just wooden clapboards, they had some that were wooden, you know, vertical boards and some that were half field stone and um, half collaborative. Really, really nice variety. A lot of good architecture there. Any other questions or input? Didn't he develop the furniture when he developed Pine Orchard? Pine Orchard developed? I'm going to come to that in a minute. Let me open up another image because I got I to scoot around on the uh, flash drive here and I'll bring something up. Yeah, so that's an interesting topic because you have the Pine Orchard Association, the Pine Orchard Improvement Association, and 
and the AM Young Company, which of course spun off all a lot of land trust properties and things like that. So let me hit escape and close this and bring up another document. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, cool. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can view this full screen so it's not all distracting. Uh, whoops, now I lost it. <clears throat> Let me open it again. Okay. Excellent. It's fascinating listening to me talk to a laptop. It can be done just well. Okay. Wow, this was actually faster than the last time I presented this. I think I was talking faster this time. Okay. And I'll just plug this in. So we talked about Young's Pond, and is anybody familiar with a property called Bob's Woods? Looking at land trust people over here. Okay. Let me do this without breaking any of Jenna's equipment. Let's see. Okay. So this is information that I actually received from Judy Miller, who's active with the Shoreline Greenway Trail. So thank you for sending that. So this is a little bit of information. We have, and, and I don't know if, oh, let's see, there you go. There you go. Okay, so as Sue was mentioning, we were gonna do this walk um, this coming weekend, but we can tell it's gonna be a rain out. I'm already getting rain out notices for Boy Scout groups and things like that. Let me see. Okay. If I could keep a laser pointer in my hand, I'd be a very happy person. Anybody see where I put it? Oh, I heard someone say that. Okay. I really am turning into an old absent minded professor. Um, but, but for the walk, when it does eventually happen, which we hope will be weekend after this, we're going to start um, down here um, by the, oh, I'm sorry, we're going to start here in the P for parking lot right there. And then uh, the plan is to walk up along Blackstone Avenue which Alden M. Young had had constructed specifically so that his daughter would have a short and direct ride from the train station down to his estate at the Anchorage for her wedding. So all those stone walls and everything, that's all Alden Young. Thank you very much. And this is the Pine Orchard Yacht Club right here. Um, we're going to walk out here and then walk on part of the shore, on part of the White Trail, the Brantford Trail, and then go up the hill. I mean, that's a little bit steep. We especially didn't want to do that with mud on it. And then back down here, take a look at some of the foundations. His ice house was down here. I'm sorry, I'll talk into the mic, Jenna. His ice house was right down here. There's a little remnant of a dock there. Um, they had an open cabin. They had a closed cabin. All sorts of cool stuff down there. Um, and we'll walk a little bit further probably to look into where the young estate was and where if they were still standing. And some of the buildings are still standing. They were converted. Um, you'd see the dairy barn, the piggery, and things like that. Up in the north end, uh, that's now part of the golf course, and even further north, he owned that property. And that's where he had a greenhouse and a place for winter storage of exotic plants and trees and things like that. So keep an eye on your emails. If you get emails from either the Shoreline Greenway Trail or the Brantford Historical Society, you'll hear about those. If you don't get emails, from either of those groups, you know, you can contact one of the other organizations just to be asked to put onto their email list. Laser pointer pocket. Let's see if I remember this time. Okay. And we'll look at one more thing and then we'll be done. And then it'll be time for refreshments. So I'm standing between you and refreshments. A.M. Young and other people wanted Blackstone Avenue built. They asked the town to build it. Oh, yeah. and, and like five years later, the town still was deciding that we're going to build it. And that's when Young just built it. Uh, and, yeah. and, and I hope everybody that's knows. Surprise anyone that it took the town five years to make it. So, so I hope everybody realizes this is Jane Bully, town historian, who's written a book called, I think it's called The Streets of Brantford. Is that the exact title? And that's about the street names. Like I've got a little cul-de-sac 
near where I live. And I never knew that was a place where the, the homeowner built that road and wanted to make it into a town. Or this, this is that little one off of uh, McKinnell Court, Jane. I think it was they were going to call it Bel Air, but it never got recognized as a town road. So now it's just somebody's driveway with one other house off to the side. So that's a great book. That's available through the Historical Society. Let's see if I can get this um, open. Hmm. It's a JPEG, but it doesn't want to open. Okay, that's not going to open. But what what you would be seeing right now if you're working is a great uh, photo that Sue Winkle sent me of a photograph of part of the Young Estate showing it right at the very beginning. Uh, did, does anybody know, besides Jane Bully, does anybody know the old name for Pine Orchard before it was called Pine Orchard? It was called World's End. Oh. Yeah, kind of a doozy. And, and then, then they were going to have, when it partially got settled, they were going to have a post office there and they applied for a post office name and they wanted Pine Orchard, pretty name. Well, it turns out there was already some sort of postal district called Pine Orchard up in Killingworth. I searched for records of that. There are a few places called Pine Orchard Road up in Killingworth, but I couldn't find a record of that um, post office. And of course, Pine Orchard no longer has its own post office. So um, Pine Orchard post office was going to be named Felsmere, I think the name is, which was the name of a local farm. And Pine Orchard, you know, all, all these you know, wealthy summer people said, yeah, we're not taking Felsmere. That doesn't sound pretty. So they were able to pull some strings and get the, the post office named Pine Orchard Post Office. But World's End was the old name for Pine Orchard. There was a World's End Creek and it ran right down the middle of what's now the Pine Orchard Yacht and Country Club golf course. So of course, what they did was they filled that in, they filled that in, made the golf course, and then they realized later they weren't making it as a golf club without you know having the yacht and country club part so they invested after they got permission from the state and the federal government in filling everything up to where the seawall is now down at the pine orchard yacht and country club they moved the clubhouse for the pine what was the pine orchard golf club all the way down to the waterfront and that's when they started putting in swimming pools tennis courts not in that order um uh, the harbor right there with the big breakwater, they dredged it like President Taft. His, one of his offices had to approve the uh, plan. But that's how they went from being the Pine Orchard Golf Club to being the Pine Orchard Yacht and Country Club. And apparently it's one of the only places, if anybody here is a member, one of the only places in Connecticut or in the U.S. that has yachting, swimming, tennis, and golf all in one facility. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so that's, um, yeah, so that's didn't realize it was a big deal. I've never been a member. So. So was there a large area of pine trees? That's had a spring not grow now. Is that why they decided to pull it? I think so. I mean, there is, there was a lot of the young woods and then around the, you know, that whole area. And then around the Go ahead. Oh, well, hang, hang on just a sec. The, 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 the question was, is there an orchard of pines in Pine Orchard? And I'm sorry, if I ever don't repeat a question back so everybody can hear it, let me know and I'll repeat it back. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there's some uh, white pines down there right now in that little triangle. Yeah, so um, yeah, the pines are native around here. Oh, why was it? It was what was that Rachel Carley's talk at the Pine Orchard Club back yeah that, that we had over 100 people there that was a great talk I've got some of her research materials for when we talk more about Pine Orchard specifically. I'm not a Pine Orchard historian. I've only scratched the surface and depleted the entire Blackstone Library book collection for, for what I've learned about for this for Alden Young. Yeah, it extended really far. They were going to do an 18-hole golf course and go all the way up to where... 
I don't know. I, I don't know where that is. Is that Thimble Farms Road or? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The question is flirtation point. Was that part of the young estate? But I, the young estate mainly went north. Because as I said, other people were laying out. Um, Ellis Baker and uh, Warner were laying in, I think, Blackstone. Those three families were laying out other areas. Go ahead. Oh, what area? Sunset. Oh, Sunset Hill. Yes, it was huge. I'm looking at Jen and she's looking away because there, there is a map like that, but it's actually very delicate. Um, I have a plan in the future to get that entire thing out and get a really high resolution photo taken of it so we don't break the map pulling out. So please don't come and ask for the Alden Young map because it might be the last time it ever gets handled in one piece. We're, we're going to figure that one out for preservation's sake. It's not really delicate. It's huge. Yeah. <laughs> it's like eight foot by eight foot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I looked at the scale. It's like 100 feet to one inch, which if you think about the distance, it's got to be a good, is that a, a half mile from the shoreline up to Damascus Road? That, that's a long way. So, yeah, it, that, that's a big map. Well, I can talk for like three, four more hours with less and less actual knowledge about Pine Orchard, but or I can stop now and we can have refreshments. Any other questions or anything else you'd like to talk about? Okay, uh, class dismissed. <laughs> Thank, thanks very much.